for this meeting possible. Uh, some of our sponsors, Cass County Ag Improvement Association, uh, the Ransom County Crop and Livestock Improvement Association, uh, the NDSU Extension Service, the NDSU Department of Animal Science, uh, the North Central Research Extension Center, uh, the Carrington Research Exten Extension Center, uh, Theraldson Ethanol, Blue uh, Flint Ethanol, and the North Dakota Corn Council. So all those uh, in our groups uh, played a major part in helping uh, make this meeting uh, possible today. Uh, my name is Brian Zemperg. I work down in Ransom County as the Extension uh, Agent, and I'm going to serve as your host this afternoon. Uh, we're going to get going with uh, Galen's going to uh, talk uh, about some storage uh, issues uh, this afternoon uh, with the ethanol products. So uh, at this time, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Galen and uh, get going with his presentation this afternoon. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, can you hear me? If you can hear me, okay, again, uh, Scott, maybe give me a message, but <clears throat> I'm sure your lunch was better than mine, so uh, I hope uh, I hope things are good there. And I uh, basically, I was going to talk a little bit about what it costs to store, as well as um, maybe pricing options on on distillers grains and then also then jump into stories things that we've tried here at nebraska both at the university but also i'm going to share uh, quite a few uh, anecdotal stories from producers across the state that have allowed us to watch what they've done and and record it and and gather some information from them at the end i'm i'm, I'm quite excited because we're also going to compare feeding uh stored material versus not storing it and just mixing it fresh and uh, the part i'm kind of most excited about is that we've allowed some to spoil and fed it to compare to some that was not spoiled and uh, be kind of interesting to show you that data okay so a lot of a uh, lot of people have been very interested in in storage of distillers grains and the reason that that they have been is because we thought it would be economical to store, and I'll go through some of those examples here in a minute. Before I do that, uh, Carl and, and the committee asked me to discuss a program briefly that we use to make decisions on whether to purchase distillers grains and how much to feed. We've called that uh, cattle code. It's a, it's a complete budget type model that uses the performance data that I showed you from earlier on the meta-analysis. In other words, the, the comparison of performance on different levels of different uh, byproducts. You put in the feed ingredient costs that you have that you've been quoted, and then, uh, and then it calculates how much it costs to get it to, the, to your operation from the ethanol plant, how much you're going to feed, and then uh, put in the cattle interest and feed interest and it'll basically do a budget that shows, okay, how much more or less can I make if I feed uh, distiller's grains? Now, so far, <clears throat> excuse me, so far cattle code focuses on um, just the feedlot sector, uh, but I think many people <clears throat> know how to do the calculation to do it on a, uh, a cow-calf operation, but I want to go through that here just real briefly as well. So this is a picture of, of the basically the entire sheet that is cattle code, and it is available online, and I have it up on my, uh, on my computer. So if you bear with me for just one second here, I'm going to try and uh, uh, share with you so you can see uh, the screen that I'm using that's got the actual uh uh cattle code on it so hopefully that shows up there now um <clears throat> and then we'll go back to the slides here in a minute so when you first come to uh to this um excel file there's there's really only two sheets on there it's one that just has a description of it and the uh the uh different inputs and outputs that come so it's just a 
real simple description of what it is. And then the other sheet is where you put in the steps that you want to actually follow. So up top here <clears throat> right now, <clears throat> excuse me, is a 740-pound steer that's going to be fed to 1,300 pounds. And what you do here is these are the inputs if you were just going to feed them grain. So this is without the byproduct you're going to feed them. And so in this example, the cattle are eating 24 pounds a day, a conversion of 6.5. Uh, the price on calves, now that was a little while ago, so we could change that and, uh, and, and make these, hopefully they're both higher. Uh, let's just put them in at 134 and 110. I assume that you can see me, uh, see me doing that. Um, and then uh, medicine costs, death loss, and, and yardage ch charges, et cetera. You know, you really want to make sure that this is as accurate as you want it to be for your operation. Now, that's the first step. And most people get confused. You actually got to put in what are you using, what, what was performance for uh, cattle fed just a grain-based diet, not – what are they going to perform like if you use the byproduct? Because that's what this program predicts. Okay, down below here is probably the most important part because this is what compares different ingredients to corn. And when this program was developed a few years ago, corn price was $3. And so you can see what our corn prices are that are in there as default. And you can download this and, and again, modify it the way you want. Now, the whole way this program works is that you call the plants and get a price. And these prices are not accurate today, again, because prices have, have easily doubled now recently. So the examples only as good, though, as the prices you put in. And so I want to go through this because uh, it, it, it basically makes comparing apples to apples a lot easier. One of the challenges on pricing distiller's grains and, and other feeds is that you get those prices on a per ton basis, and that's probably a per ton as is or as fed. And what you really want is a price per ton of dry matter to compare then to a price per ton of dry matter on corn. Well, as an example, if I don't know if you can see this, but that corn has a uh, 330 and the is 137 uh, 83 if I change that to six dollars that price is two hundred and fifty dollars per ton of dry matter now that's the important number to compare to the prices above of wet distillers grains as an example at $70 per ton, if that's what you get quoted, turns out to be $218.75 per ton of dry matter, or as a percentage of corn is 88% right now. So if for no other reason, this program allows you to quickly identify, okay, what are my, <clears throat> what are my prices of corn that I'm paying or could get paid for my own corn? And what is the price quoted to me from the local ethanol plant for distiller's grains? And they're going to give you, your corn price is quoted in dollars per bushel, and the ethanol plant is going to give you dollars per ton as is at the plant, and those two numbers cannot be compared. It's very difficult to compare those two. The only two numbers, which I assume you can see, are these two numbers, this 218.75, and this 249.96. Okay, but once all that's inputted and you put in ingredients, other ingredients in their cost, what happens is, is on this, this just next to those, the step three, it has a list here of, of different ingredients and then what's the inclusion. So right now in this example, it has wet distiller's grains included at 10% with a 50-50 mixture of, of high moisture corn and dry rolled corn. Um, and, and then 
ten percent distillers grains the, the split displacing those mixtures of dry rolled and high moisture corn. You could just use dry rolled corn if that's what you're in fact feeding. And anyway, it talks about okay, what is my my pounds that I'm getting per load? Some trucks are thirty ton loads, some trucks are twenty five ton loads. What's my price per loaded mile? Again, that's probably a low number based on today's economics, et cetera, et cetera. How many miles from the plant am I? If you're closer to the plant, your trucking distance is going to be less charged than if you're further away from the plant. So it allows you to manipulate that, if you will, on how, how much transportation is going to cost you. And then, uh, then it, all of that information is put in, and then you get output. And so what it does is it predicts how is dry matter intake going to change, how is feed conversion and average daily gain going to change, and how will days on feed, if they gain more, how will that change as well. It puts in the feeding costs and the non-feeding costs, uh, the, the cost of, uh, of uh, the cost per head of, of hauling, and then your ration uh, characteristics and cost, total feed cost, and then uh, your feed cost again. And notice then it gives a profit loss based on those, those numbers that you put in on the first input, step one. Okay, all of that's not different than anything else that you may have used in the past, but here's where it changes is that this is then compared to this column of not feeding a byproduct. So if you feed distiller's grains at 10% inclusion, which is what we happen to have been up above, compared to not feeding, you stand to make $27 more per head than if you didn't feed it. Now, hopefully everybody there that's got a feedlot that's in the audience is knows, notices what the P&L is on this steer based on those costs I put in. And that's uh, unfortunately not far off with what some cattle are going to do probably that are in the yard today, unfortunately. So it doesn't say that you're going to make $27 a profit. What it says is, is that you're making $27 more than if you hadn't fed distillers grain. Now, I don't know how well that showed up. But, um, this program, again, is available for you for download. And uh, if you want to do that, um, you know, you're welcome to download that and uh, play with it. If there's questions, we can come back to that uh, uh, next time. I'll go back to the slides here now and, uh, and uh, go from there. Okay, so... <clears throat> What the rest of the topic then that I'm going to discuss with you primarily, and again, we can come back to the cattle code if there's questions, is how do you store this? And first off, why would you store it and what's it going to cost? Well, to be frank about it, the reason that we got into this storage issue of wet distillers grains is because we have a lot of cattle and a lot of cattle close to ethanol plants. And so most of our ethanol plants prefer to make wet distillers grain. Then they, they don't want to spend the extra money to dry the distillers grain down and ship it out of the state or out of the country. But um, the problem with that approach is, is that our cattle in feedlots goes down in the summer months. And so we approached, we started into this uh, four or five years ago because we saw dramatic decreases in the price of distiller's grain through the summer months, which means it's a good time to be purchasing uh, distiller's grains. And that's primarily because of this decrease in uh, cattle on feed numbers, as you can see here in, in July and August. And so if I was going to purchase distiller's grains one month of the year here in Nebraska, I'd make sure I was year in, year out purchasing in July or August. Now, this is another diagram that illustrates that, and I realize it doesn't show up well, but the red bars are cattle on feed in the U.S., okay? And so, again, I'm just pointing out that, that cattle on feed in the U.S. drops to around 10 million head 
uh, in feedlots in the summer months as compared to 11 and a half for 12 through the fall winter months. Now, why, so what? Why is that necessarily uh, uh, related to the stiller's price? Well, if you look at this blue line that's, that's in the background, and on the y-axis over here is relative price, the cheapest price for distillers grains year in, year out is in the summer months, and we believe that's a cause and effect. That because cattle on feed numbers are lower, the distillers price is lowest in the summer months. So my only point of saying all that is, is that that's what led us into this type of work and uh, really uh, has been why, what, what people have adopted. Now, that's for a feedlot even. Uh, they could purchase their feed needs potentially in the summertime. But it's also really important then for a cow-calf producer that may need supplement in the winter, and yet that's when they can't get into the, into the distiller's grains market and or it's the worst time to get into the distiller's market because that's when it's going to be the highest price. So the benefit of storage is really for small producers that can't handle semi-load quantities and feed it up fast enough and for small operations and cow, small feeders and cow-calf producers that want to purchase feed in the summertime and feed it out later on throughout the year. Now, I mentioned this when we first started, and, that, and I think it's an important point, and it's sort of a feed sheet. When I'm talking about storage of distiller's grains, I'm going to show you some examples where we mixed a forage in with the distiller's grains at, say, 80% distiller's, 20% uh, forage, and that's on a dry matter basis. Now, notice that because the forage might be 15% water or less and the distiller's grains is 65% water or more, that when I go to weigh them out and mix them together into a bunker, I really only need about 9.3% forage and about 90.7% distiller's grains. So my point is, is that there's a big difference between inclusion on a dry matter basis and inclusion on an as-is basis or as-fed basis. Notice 20% uh, versus 9.3, 80% versus 90.7. So it's really important that, that, that whoever's mixing this, and again, if you're used to feeding cattle, you have to deal with this some anyway, but your nutritionist or, or extension or someone may help you with these calculations. My only point is it's important to, to understand the difference between dry matter and as fed because it dramatically influences how much you're going to mix. As an example, if you were going to mix up 20,000 pounds of this or 10 ton, you would need 18,133 pounds of distillers. If you did it on an as on a dry matter basis, you would have loaded incorrectly uh, 16,000 pounds of distiller's grain. So it makes a big difference whether you're working on a dry matter or as fed basis. When you go to load it in the truck, it's got to be as fed. When it comes to the nutrition of the cattle, dry matter is the only thing that's important. Okay, what else do you need? Well, if you're going to mix this to bag it or to put it in a bunker and mix it with forage, you'll need some uh, equipment to handle it which for some producers that can be a limitation. You will likely need to grind any of your forages that you're going to uh, uh, mix with the distiller's grains. Now, we've run things through our mixer wagons or trucks with scales, uh, primarily because uh, we wanted to do it accurately. I'm not sure that's a requirement in, in all operations, that that mix is just perfect, but that's the way we've done it. And then if you want a bag, generally you could have a bagger, but you may want to just hire that out. That's the most common way. Okay, so if you're an operation and you're going to store wet distiller's grains for feeding later because you want to buy it when it's cheap in the summertime, you have to account for how much you're going to lose. Now, the definition we use for that is shrink. No matter what happens, you will never uh, feed the same amount that you purchase. I don't care who you are, you never feed all of it. You're always going to lose some. Now, 
it may dry out. You may not weigh it out accurately. You may actually lose some to fermentation losses, et cetera. But that strength is really important. And it's important to know what that number is because if you're going to store it and you lose half of it because you stored it, that's probably not going to be a good deal. If you lose 5%, though, versus 15%, that could be the difference on whether it's smart to store it or not. So my point is, is we've got to estimate that, and uh, we've got some data on this, but I'm just saying that, that the numbers that we propose is, is likely 3 to 6% if you're bagging, 5 to 15 if you're if you're bunkering it or putting it into a bunker. And, again, data is always best, and if anybody stores this, it's always great to measure how much dry matter did you purchase versus how much dry matter did you get fed or delivered to the cattle. Okay, so now there's sophisticated and then less sophisticated ways of doing this. Uh, our, our economist, Dr. Daryl Mark, that we work closely with, uh, who's obviously going to do it the more sophisticated way, has developed a computer model as well. And then we've also provided a hand calculation sheet, uh, which is what, of course, I use generally because it's a little simpler. Well, we want you to account for how much the byproduct costs, so the cost of wet distiller's grains at the plant, the cost of the forage or whatever you're going to mix with it, if you're going to mix anything with it. Uh, that'll give you the total cost of your feeds. We have a mechanism to account for the transportation or the cost of getting it delivered. Generally, those loads are going to be 25 to 30 ton loads. Obviously, we have to cover the cost because it is a fairly labor-intensive process when it's first stored. Have to account for fuel costs, which obviously in today's uh, market is is a great is a big issue. There's a cost of your bunker, even if you have one on hand. There's a cost to your having a bunker, and there's a cost to bagging if you choose to bag it. You may rent equipment, so you may have other equipment costs that you got to account for. Uh, plastic if you're going to cover it, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's an interest on when you buy that feed compared to when you actually utilize it at the cattle. So, uh, again, Dr. Mark has sophisticated this in a spreadsheet, which I will briefly show you. And then uh, I'll also show you, though, a hand calculator that does this. But it, it does a lot of things where it'll tell you your total cost on an as-is basis, your total cost on a dry matter basis, which I think is very useful for producers to compare. It'll give you estimates of, of your shrink. Of course, you put that in, but, I mean, it'll give you an estimate of what that shrink does to your cost. And so you can get total cost on a dry matter basis with the shrink included, which, again, I think is an important cost to keep in mind. So there's a manual that we put together uh, three or four years ago that sort of described our experiences at that point. It was sort of a cookbook, so to speak, of different mixes that could be tried that we knew would work well. Uh, but in this manual, which, uh, again, I've shared and, and hopefully is part of your materials there today, uh, on, on uh, one of the pages on the inside there, I believe it's uh, – just one second, it is page 14 in that manual, uh, is the, the sort of hand calculator uh, example of doing all of these different costs to eventually get to how much does this cost you if you're going to store this and how much does it add to your feed cost. So make sure this is crystal clear. Just getting material in in the summer and storing it is not uh, a free um, process. It, there is cost to it. So the only way the, that storing wet distiller's grains makes any sense at all is with the assumption that it will cost you less if you buy it in the summer and that, that, therefore, if you can buy it at a cheaper cost, some of these extra costs of storing it will be offset because the original feed was cheaper. I think most people assume that there's not much cost on storage, and there is. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing that. Well, and if you want the more sophisticated uh, uh, approach with the Excel file, 
there's four steps in that Excel file, and I have a picture of it. And uh, basically, you put in what times you're doing this, what your interest rate are and your shrink, your uh, feed costs that it took you to purchase that, what your equipment costs are, and then, and then all your labor and transportation and, and interest. And so it, uh, it does a good job of analyzing those costs. Again, just like cattle code, uh, this one is called uh, 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 cattle store, and it's, uh, it's uh, a model that predicts the storage costs with multiple steps. It's actually fairly simple to use and allows you to, uh, to play with that. Uh, again, unless there's questions, I may not switch over and share that, that screen with you at this point but be happy to go through an example if there's a lot of interest in that there. Okay, now maybe into some of the, uh, the details of what we've tried. There'll be a lot of pictures here, so I have a lot of slides, but it's mostly pictures and, and things for me just to comment on and then move on. So uh, wet, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't go on the tour, obviously, this morning, but I'm presuming that's wet distiller's grains there and not modified. If that's wrong, we'll talk a little bit about modified. But at least with wet distiller's grains, this here is a picture of a payloader. And the whole concept of this picture is, is that you cannot drive on wet distiller's grains and pack it in. The payloader wheels just, just uh, spin out underneath it. And uh, Terry Kloffenstein, a colleague here at Nebraska, uses the analogy that the wet distiller's grains is like mashed potatoes. Hopefully every, everybody there can relate to what mashed potatoes are like. So just imagine trying to drive a payloader on a big pile of mashed potatoes. It just doesn't work to, to pack it in. As you can see, the payloader just drives into it. It doesn't actually drive up on it. And you won't be doing that very long before you get stuck. So the concept that we started with is, is, is let's mix some low-quality forage in with it. Uh, this is just our research station where we are grinding uh, wheat straw. We've tried corn stalks. We've tried about any forage that's available to, uh, quote, unquote, bulk up the wet distiller's grains with the goal in mind that you either bag it under pressure or drive on it in a bunker and pack it in. So our experience at, at the university is, is that if you try and put wet distiller's grains in a bag and you put pressure on the bag, you will have to rebag it the next day. No, the, the, the material is so dense and has so much pressure that if you put any pressure on it, it will expand and, and blow out the bag. Now, to be fair, just to be really clear here, wet distiller's grains will go into a bag and it'll keep in a bag. You just can't put any pressure on it. And so I think it's fairly clear in this picture, the top of this bag is right here I don't know if you can see it because there's a bag of corn silage behind here, but this is modified distiller's grains. And then right here is where we switched over to the wet distiller's grains. And you can see that the, the height of this bag is about there. So the bag is about twice as wide and about a third of the height if you put wet distiller's grains in a bag. But again, it'll work. You just can't put any pressure on it. Modified distiller's grains will go into a bag because it's been partially dried, will go into a bag just fine under pressure. So this is again our bagging system. Again, we mixed everything through trucks, so we knew the right mixes. And we've tried adding different levels, if you will, or different concentrations in the mix of these bulky forages. So we obviously, this blew out. And so we were putting pressure on the bag and, and we didn't have much forage in because that was one of the treatments and it blew that part out. As we added more forage uh, to that mix, it started to bag fine under pressure. And so we were trying to determine if you want to bag wet distiller's grains under pressure, what's the minimum amount of forage? The other thing we've tried, again, this is our, our research station, is uh, bunk put, putting these materials into a bunker and being able to drive on it. So this right here is 30% grass hay. We happen to use grass hay for this. And this is 40% grass hay on a dry basis. And then we were able to easily drive on that and pack it. Now, another common question about this is, well, is this like making silage? Does it in silo? And, and I want to caution you that 
this the concept is very much like silage where what you want to do is get the air aware away from it so oxygen is the enemy so if you can keep oxygen out of this it will dramatically improve your storage and decrease spoilage so yes we're packing it in like silage but it's not because it's going to go through the ensiling process it's primarily just to keep the oxygen away and keep it from spoiling so again, you can see we were able to drive on that with no problem, and uh, it packed in quite well, just like silage, again, to get all the air out. We had a conference at our station a few, uh, a couple of years ago, and we did some mixes, which is what they're mixing right here, and, uh, and packing it in. This happens to be a pile of straight wet distiller's grains. We had modified distiller's grains that we just piled up straight. We had wet distiller's grains, again, that we just tried to pile. And then what we did is we covered those piles, and we also covered the mixes that we made. So you can see that we covered everything that we did in plastic and, and, uh, and put tires on it. We let it sit for, I think it was about 30 days ahead of the conference, maybe longer, 45 days. And then we had the meeting, and we opened them up for the first time. So when you open up those bags, this is the modified distiller's grains that was just piled straight and covered in plastic. So you can see that it doesn't look very good. And when you dig that away, you get about, oh, a six to eight inch layer that's, that's pretty poor, obviously, and spoiled. But I will point out that below that spoilage layer, all the way down, that modified distiller's grains from that point on, is quote unquote just as good as the day we brought it in so my point is you can pile it straight and cover it you'll just get some spoilage on the top and then once it seals off it's sort of uh, preserved if you will down below this is the mixture of, of forage mixed in with wet distillers grains it's not a, as good of a picture because it's not as far back into the bunker but not near as dramatic of uh, spoilage only a couple of inches instead of uh, 8 to 10. These are those bags that I had shown you originally where we had a, a taller bag of modified distillers and a, and a much more uh, lower height bag that was wet distillers grains. And then we opened those bags up again after about 30 to 40 days of storage for the conference. And they look as good as the day we put them in there. So again, you can bag wet distiller's grains with no pressure. You just, it, it takes more area and you gotta be a little careful on, on, uh, on when you're feeding to feed it up fast enough. So what we've tried is we've tried adding wheat straw, corn stalks, we've used grass hay to uh, wet distiller's grains. So all of these are with wet distiller's grains. And then we've also uh, added corn stalks and wheat straw to modified distiller's grains. Now, in some cases, in a feedlot situation, you're actually trying to get just the minimum amount of material to bulk it up. And so, again, these just happen to be numbers that we tried that worked. In the bunkers, we've added 25 to 30 percent wheat straw and been able to drive on it. We did a different study where we happened to need more corn stalks, so we added 45 to 55 percent corn stalks. We've added 30 to 40 percent grass hay, and they all worked. Now that's all on a dry matter basis. My point of saying that is, is notice that that if I add 12 and a half percent wheat straw on a dry matter basis in a bag to bag wet distiller's grains under pressure, that's only about five and a half percent on an as-is basis. So it's a lot different when you go to weigh it out in the trucks and mix it up. So those are things that we've tried and, uh, and gotten along real well and, and had no trouble with storage. Okay, so what have producers tried? Well, uh, this is a, a project near Odessa where they stored wet distiller's grains. Uh, Ken Hubbard, he mixed them with, with forage he had, um, uh, sorry, and uh, drove on it and uh, packed it on just like he would his silage. This is the pile when it was done. The criticism here is, is that that pile is way too wide and not near tall enough. The goal in making silage and making these storage piles is to make them a lot taller 
and a lot less uh, wide because you want to decrease the surface area. So the second year he made a much better pile. It was much more narrow and a lot taller and uh, more successful in our opinion. Other producers have used, uh, instead of uh, just piling it outside and driving on it, they actually put hay bales around. This is a cow-calf producer and made a makeshift bunker. They piled hay down, excuse me, they ground some hay and, and, and spread it out on the ground. Then they brought in the wet distiller's grains and dumped it on top of the hay and sort of layered it in. And then they mixed it. Once they had piled some wet distiller's grains on it, they actually used the front end loader here to do the mixing as they pushed it into the bunker. And so they did not run it through the mixer trucks and weigh it all out. They sort of layered it in and then mixed it up as they were packing it and pushing it up. Um, so obviously, if you can't tell which one of those works for the University of Nebraska, that's Denny Bauer, who's got the red Nebraska coat on. He's an extension educator out there. Once they had piled it, they covered it in plastic and with hay, and it just looked uh, great underneath. So there was plastic on it. They actually put some hay on top of that to, to try and make the seal even better and uh, worked just great for them. Uh, others have just tried to pile it. Uh, this was a producer. I, I've cut out a lot of the slides that you uh, that I had shared that that may be printed for you just for the sake of time here. Um, but this was uh, this was I think 30 or 40 loads of wet distillers grains in the summertime, more or less piled on the corner of a pivot and uh, allowed to sit there. So this was put out in July or, or August. I can't remember. Out near uh, Madrid's, out near North Platte. This was coming back uh, a few months later. You notice that the color is a fairly nice bright yellow here, uh, and then it gets much darker as it's stored and dries out. And um, if you looked at that pile, it looked fine on the surface, sort of dry, but when you dig down into it, you'll notice that there's a spoilage layer here and then once you get below that spoilage layer, again, it looks pretty good, um, as good as the day it was put in. But this was left uncovered and, uh, and just allowed to sit there. Again, the cost has to be pretty low, but that's the way the, that these folks wanted to store it at that time and then feed it out later. And, of course, we've done some things at the Goodmanson Ranch where, uh, again, piling uh, in a bu makeshift bunker, putting plastic all around it and uh, piling in wet distiller's grains and sort of sealing it back up. Um, so it looks like a nice uh, nice pile. Looked good once it was opened. Uh, really had very little spoilage. This is that same pile being opened later. Hardly any spoilage on top or anywhere else on that because it was sealed really well. Okay, what we've also tried to do is we've tried to evaluate whether you need to add a cover to it or just let it sit and to do that we could either use a whole bunch of bunkers or we could use barrels and our barrels serve as a as a as a to mimic if you will or simulate a bunker situation so in this case we were looking at covering it with plastic uh, this is actually sand that we poured on top of the plastic like you'd put a tire down on a bunkers on a bunker that was covered in plastic and then this is opening that barrel uh, 45 days later. Notice that here in the middle where there was no air that got to that material looks just as good as the day we put it in. Around the edges where, that, where it wasn't sealed is where it spoiled some, but not much on the plastic covered barrels. We also sprinkled salt on this at about one pound per square foot. This was the day that it was put in and this is what it looked like after being stored for 45 days. Again, we want to see how much spoilage would occur. And these were our controls. If we just put mixed wet distiller's grains with straw and put it in these bunkers and uh, let it sit for 45 days, notice what happens. On the very surface, it dries out and looks pretty good. But once you move down through, you really get three layers. And, uh, and then down below this layer, once you get down in the barrel down here, then that material looks pretty good and looks like it did when we put it in. So my point is, is if you just pile it and pack it, you will get a fair amount of spoilage on the surface. I think that's normal. 
Some producers, the question came up this morning about distiller solubles. Some producers will actually use those solubles and spray it on top of the bunker. So we went ahead and mimicked that. We sprayed solubles on top of these barrels, either uh, with or without salt, and, and looked to see how much spoilage and, and losses we had. So basically the students went in and, and recorded how much weight was spoiled and how much was, was not spoiled, how much we lost, and uh, which covers were best. So to kind of summarize that, if you were in a 10-foot bunker, our estimates are that you'd lose 35 to 5% of the dry matter. And depending upon the cover, we saw anywhere from 1% to 15% spoilage, uh, which you got to keep in mind that just because it spoils, you're probably going to feed it. And so just because it's spoiled, we assume that we would, we would need to quantify that amount and uh, that that's going to end up being fed to, to the cattle. Plastic. Covering it in plastic resulted in the least amount. Obviously, uncovered and just left out as a control was the most, and the solubles and salt were kind of intermediate. Now, the last thing is if you're going to use syrup and spray it on top of a bunker storage, so to speak, you're going to lose 25 to 50 percent of that material that you're using as a cover, and that's just important to keep in mind. In other words, a lot of people like to do this, but the solubles better be cheap because you're going to lose at least half of it or, or, uh, or at least 25% of it. In general, when the distiller spoils, the fat is lowered, the pH is dramatically higher in the spoiled layer compared to the unspoiled. Fibers increase because you lose fat and you don't lose as much fiber. The minerals increased or concentrated some and the proteins either unchanged or increase some. So in essence, you're, the, the, the spoilage process uses up the fat and uh, sort of keeps all the mineral and the protein and the fiber around, so to speak. Okay, so that's kind of a, a quick overview. And uh, I, don't, I know that's fast, but I also know it's after lunch, and so hopefully uh, that was okay. Um, but we wanted to look at so what what happens if you have this distiller's grains and it spoils what's the impact of using that spoiled material so we went and we got distiller's grains from the same plant and we put it in a in a bag or in a bunker clearly if you look at this bunker it's a lot of spoilage in that bunker we actually had two bunkers we were we fed out some cattle feeding that material compared to a bag and after 30, 39 days of storage, you got quite a bit of spoilage. And if it was in the bag, you didn't get hardly any. So it clearly was different. This is the bunker halfway through the feeding trial. And this is down towards the end. And again, you can see that on top of there, we're getting some areas where we've got a lot of spoilage and it did not look good. This is after we mixed it into the finishing diet. This is the control diet that was distiller's grains out of the bag. And this is the distiller's grains diet out of the bunker. Clearly, you could just visually see which, which treatment had the spoiled stuff in it. And if you looked at the composition, the fat was actually uh, a little bit higher as a percentage in the non-spoiled or bagged uh, distiller's grains. That little bit of spoil or that spoilage that you saw in the bunker lowered the amount of fat, increased the amount of fiber, protein was unchanged, pH was a little higher as you'd expect, mineral was higher as you'd expect, and actually the bunker got wetter and then it got drier at the end. So, but I don't know if the dry matter matters. This is going to change. The, the stuff left out in the bunker is going to change depending upon what the weather does. If it was in North Dakota, it would have been about 10% dry matter this year, so at least based on what I hear up there. So we lost about 12% of the, of the material out of that bunker just from storing it, so about 12% less. If we, whatever we purchased, 12% was gone, and you have to account for that loss and when you price those ingredients. Uh, we lost 16% of the fat that we bought. We lost 8% of the fiber and about the same amount of protein as dry, excuse me, as what we lost in dry matter. Pretty bad stuff. So how do you think they perform? Well, this is a corn-based diet that we fed as a control. This is the 20 individually steers, 20 individually fed head steers. 
This is the the bagged distiller's grains that was not as spoiled, obviously, in a bag, fed to 20 steers. And this is the spoiled material out of that bunker that you looked at. So these guys, you would guess, would do poorer than these guys if you looked at those bags in the bunker. Well, what happened is, is that final weight was impacted, average daily gain was impacted, and feed to gain was impacted as well, but not the way you'd expect. Final weight was much greater, but it was greater for the two treatments, regardless of which one it was, just the two that had distiller's grains was greater than, than the cattle-fed corn. Average daily gain was greater for the two treatments that had distiller's grains, but no difference, and if anything, numerically better for the, the cattle fed out of the bunker, and feed to gain was about the same. But again, numerically better, if anything, for the, the material uh, from the cattle fed the, out of the bunker. All of them did better than the cattle fed corn, but again, that's to be expected. Carcass ter characteristics were not impacted, so I'm going to jump right through that. Okay, so we thought we were pretty smart. Spoil it, the spoiled wet distiller's grains or the stuff in the bunker had less fat. We saw the same increase in pH and, and mineral and fiber uh, compared to the bag material. But the thing that was surprising is there was no difference in performance between the stuff that had spoiled versus the stuff that uh, was allowed not to spoil. So we thought, well, that's interesting, not what we expected. So let's do it with some growing calves, and then we'll kind of have the complete picture. So we went and did it with growing calves. Same way, we fed cattle that were that, that were fed distiller's grains at 15 or 40% of the diet that was, that was stored in a bunker. And then we fed 15 or 40% distillers from distillers that was put in a bag that we're saying. So we're saying bag materials non-spoiled. Uh, Stuff put in the bunker is, is quote-unquote, spoil, allowing spoilage to occur. That's fine. This is what it looked like. This was done this fall and winter, excuse me, this winter, spring. So this was put in the, in the bunkers back in uh, November, and the trial started here in March. So it went through the winter time. Uh, this is what it looked like as we were going. doesn't look near as bad as the stuff that we fed out last summer. Uh, you know, you can see that there's clearly a discoloring across the top and some spoilage, but not near as dramatic. So what happened to performance? Um, well, interestingly, at 15% inclusion, this is the spoiled material out of a bunker that was allowed to spoil more. This is the non-spoiled material out of a bag, again, it fed at 15%. And then the same over here, but these two were fed at 40%, so just to be clear. So if you just look at these two numbers, cattle that were fed the, the distillers out of the bunker that had more spoilage ate about 1.8 pounds less per day, gained about two-tenths of a pound less, but not, not dramatically different. And if anything, uh, you know, there, there wasn't a, a significant difference there but uh, numerically, the cattle fed, the, the, the bagged distiller's grains did just as well, if not, uh, you know, a little bit numerically better. Okay, sorry, let me back up. So over here at 40%, again, the, the cattle fed out of the bag, eight more feed, gain weren't dramatically different, 2.5 versus 2.35. And notice here that if anything, the feed conversion is better uh, for cattle fed the spoiled bag material compared to non-spoiled. So it's perplexing. It's interesting, I would say. Um, but we didn't see a dramatic difference in performance. Okay, the last three slides I just want to show you. We compared feeding this stuff fresh versus stuff that we've stored. And in this first study, it was 30% wet distiller's grain, 70% corn stalks. And uh, cattle-fed material that had been stored versus fresh ate more, gained more, and were more efficient. And those were significant. So feeding this stuff, then it comes out of a bag that's been stored, was better than just mixing 30% distillers and 70% stocks fresh every day and uh, feeding them. So there was something that was improved. But here's the problem. These guys gained more, but they also ate more. So we don't know if they gained more because they just ate more 
or if it was, uh, in fact, better feed. So what we did is we went back and we said, okay, let's force the intakes to be the same. When we, when we did that, the gain was less. But here's the problem. We did not do this study right. So we, we did it the first time, we didn't get it quite right. We did it the second time, but we didn't use the same distiller's grains in both cases. And it turned out that the stuff we fed fresh was actually better, had more fat in it, and had more energy. So we messed up the second one, so then we did it a third time, and this time I think we got it right. We made we forced them to eat the same amount. We got all the same source of distillers grains and had a distiller straw mix and noticed that the stuff that was stored, those cattle gained more and were dramatically more efficient. So we believe storage with a forage in a bag anyway certainly helps performance compared to feeding fresh. So, sort of a summary of all this, which I know is a lot of material thrown at you, but but I tried to be as complete as I could. If you, you, you can store what distiller's grains alone in a bag, but you better not put any pressure on it unless it's modified distiller's grains. Uh, we've done a lot of work where we've mixed it with low-quality forages, anywhere from 15 to 50% forage with uh, 50 to 85% distillers, and we've bagged it, and we put it in bunkers, and we've never had any major problems storing it storing wet distillers grains with the forage probably improves the forage in other words that's why the siloed material or the stored material performed a little better i'm guessing there's 20 to 30 or 40 producers across the state that have done this uh, i can think of at least a dozen or more that have done it and no one's had any trouble and i'm and i'm i'm saying that on purpose is that I've never heard of a horror story of storing it. There's only one, at least in Nebraska, and I mean that because there was one story from Iowa State in a trial they did where they stored it and it, and it, and it didn't do so well. So my point is, is that a lot of people tried it and they've all gotten along good. I recommend covering it in plastic, even though it's a, it's a labor-intensive process. I think it's well worth it. You should plan on losing 5 to 15% and you should expect that the fat will be uh, slightly reduced if you store it, and that's from the spoilage process. We didn't see, we, we, we saw spoilage maybe, maybe not hurt growing performance and certainly had no impact on finishing cattle performance, and that's not what you would expect. So we're, uh, we're quite intrigued by that. With that, I think I've uh, taken plenty of your time, and I know especially since I'm on over the Internet, it's even more challenging. So I appreciate um, being able to chat with you from here, and I hope it's been, been useful, but don't know if I've taken way too much time and no time for questions. Is there any questions? There any questions? Anyone have any questions for Gil? Anyone have any questions for Gil? Has there been anything done with using the knock ones on the by product? By product? Yeah, this last study here, I kind of skipped over that. Uh, that that last study had an inoculum put onto it compared to this one that was exactly the same but without an inoculum. And, um, you know, the, the inoculums for silages and so forth are generally there to help with the fermentation and speed that fermentation process up so it ensilos faster. Because, see, here, I never really explained why the, this doesn't ensilo, but the pH of the stiller's grains coming out of those plants is already very acidic. It's a pH of three and a half to four, and that's what the final pH is for silage. So, and that's what kills off all the bacteria in silage is that really acidic environment at the end once it's in siloed. So my point is, is I'm, I would be surprised if inoculums have much benefit. Now, to be fair, notice that this, this was not significant because they both have a B, letter B on them. But you can see here that the conversions went from nine eight to nine, and so I'm, I'm and these were individually fed steers, uh, and there was uh, I think 20 animals on each of those levels, so that should be pretty good replication, and uh, 
but I'll let you decide if that's significant or not. That's the only study that we have. I'm not aware of others that have got other experiments looking at uh, use of an inoculum in this process. There may be other work out there, but I'm not aware of any. Yeah, Galen, yeah, I was wondering, um, um, any comments on that, that growing in some of the spoiled stuff and whether any of that may be harmful to cattle. And I guess when, when Greg gets up to just give his stuff, I'll ask a some question about uh, what the other types of types are. Yeah, that's a good question. We've, uh, we've, we've analyzed some of those samples, not some of them, a lot of them, for mycotoxins. We've not done the, the mold types. I know that's possible to do. Um, you know, I have some colleagues that are in the plant pathology area, and, and to be frank, um, I hope I quote them correctly, uh, they've suggested that, that isolating and analyzing for all the different fungi that are there would not be a good use of time. And so we have not tested for all the different types of fungi and molds that are there. But what we have done is what they did recommend is to test for the presence or absence of mycotoxins. And, and I've got to tell you, we've never seen any, any spikes in any mycotoxin. You know, we've tested for the suite of, of mycotoxins that are out there. You know, mycotoxins is sort of a general term for all the nasty things that some fungi can produce. And uh, we've never seen anything. In one of those, one of those studies, uh, that remember those piles of distillers I mentioned that were on the edge of the field that they had just piled up. Um, in that specific study, there was a spike in uh, xerelinone. The problem is, is that we didn't test it when it was first put out there. And we happened to have a corn year that year where we had some corn with a lot of xerelinone. So I can't promise you whether it came from the corn originally and just was in the distiller's grains to begin with, because the mycotoxins that are in corn end up in distiller's grains. There's no doubt about that. And in fact, it gets increased three times based on what we were talking about before. So I can't say that the mycotoxin was there because of spoilage or whether it was there because it came in from the corn originally in the ethanol plant. So that's the only one, though, out of... Uh, uh, 10 or 15 samples that, that have had any problem. So I, I don't want to say it that, that it appears that it's never a problem, but I would have expected us to see it if it was much of an issue. It's a good question. Hi, right, Galen. Hi, Galen. All inhibitors to put on haze to try to put up hay at a higher moisture content and let mold will happen. How about your experience with that in the distiller's grain and also cost the cost? Yeah, we've, uh, I, I've been approached about that and, uh, you know, I'm aware of those and, and I think that there's no doubt that there's uh, preservatives, if you will, that could be added. And, uh, and there's no doubt that my guess is they'll be very effective. I don't have any experience with them. We haven't tested any of them. And uh, it would be nice to have some data on that. Uh, cost effectiveness, as you know, normally that can be quite prohibitive. I, I, I mean, I think that's a common statement anyway, is that, that the cost can be prohibitive. The benefit here, though, could be is that if a preservative was able to be sprayed on, the spoilage is not occurring uh, throughout the whole pile. It's occurring at the surface where it's exposed to oxygen. So my, my point of saying that is, is that preservative costs might be very, might be decreased because you're just spraying it on the surface and that's where you need to inhibit the mold. Um, but I can't answer whether it would be effective or cost effective because I've, I've not tested. I do know Camin and, and some of those other companies that have those products are uh, quite interested in it. Just got to keep the cost down. Questions 
for giggling. The abortion the Sorry? Cause abortions of the pregnant cows. Does it cause abortions? I apologize. I couldn't hear very well here. Uh, the question was, do the most cause abortions of the pregnant cows? Uh, yes, there are a few of those. Uh, uh, beef cows are by far the most sensitive out of cattle, the most sensitive to uh, mycotoxins. That's probably one of the first, uh, unfortunately, one of the first uh, uh, symptoms of it. Finishing cattle uh, are probably the least accept- susceptible animal out there. Uh, followed by finishing swine, but breeding stock is, is very susceptible to many of those mycotoxins. depends on which one it is and how potent it is. And, in, and the problem is, to see, there's a suite of probably 20 different mycotoxins, um, and, and each one of them has a different concentration before it causes the, some of those challenges. I don't have all that information on top of my head. I apologize, but but they are a few of them are quite potent and very uh instrumental in causing abortions or or, uh, fetal problems. But like I said, we've had a lot of folks do this, and uh, no one's told me it's been a problem for them. And and my my experience is, is anything I tell people to do, and then if they go out and they try it and they have any problem at all, I'm the first one to hear about it. So uh, I'm saying that not jokingly, I'm saying that that's a good thing, and I've not heard of any problems. You it's, always, it's, it's, it's always something to check, especially if you're feeding it to breeding stock. Galen here. Galen here. Huh. That was his last presentation with us today. Galen.